All right, then. Let's pray, and then we'll get right into what God's given me for this evening. Father, thank you, Lord, as always, for your guidance, Lord, in providing for me, Father, those things that you wish for me to address, Lord, with your people. Father, we also thank you, Lord, for the good news that we received uh, this afternoon of Albert's sister and his niece trusting Christ as their Savior. Lord, what a tremendous blessing, Lord, it was to hear that. Bless, Lord, this time of teaching, and we pray and ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Now, everybody's here, as I've no doubt heard of the Apocrypha. Okay. Uh, it's also sometimes referred to as the Deuterocanon. Uh, okay, they are non-canonical books, meaning that they are not books which have been accepted as inspired scripture, and so they are not included in God's Word. Now, what I have up on the board are the 19 books that you will find in the Apocrypha. They are not the only non-canonical <laughs> books, though, that are out there uh, being passed around. I mean, here you got Tobit, Judith, uh, there is a Greek version of, of Esther, uh, Wisdom, Sirach, Baruch, the Letter of Jeremiah, Prayer of Azariah, Susanna, Bell and the Dragon. Uh, you got four different books on the Maccabees, which really are pretty much just historical. Uh, first and Second Ezra, uh, the Prayer of Manasseh, the Conflict of Adam and Eve. Uh, for the most part, they're all just spurs junk. Maccabees, like I say, is, is historical. You know? uh, but none of them were accepted. Uh, by the King James translators as being canonical books, inspired books of God. They didn't meet the text. Uh, the very first edition of the authorized version of 1611 did include the apocryphal books. They were not in the order that they are in in the Roman Catholic Bible. They were taken out of the Old Testament, taken out of the New Testament, and were placed by themselves between the two. And that's only because you had a couple of Catholic agents uh, posing as Protestants on that board. The very next printing they were taken out and have never been back in there. All right, one thing I want to touch on real quick, I'm not suggesting you read any of the books that I'm going to be mentioning tonight. I'm bringing them up only because I want you to be aware of them uh, because some of them you're going to hear about. Uh, one in particular that's been very popular lately is the Book of Enoch. Uh, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, there are actually, so far to my count, 37 spurious or non-canonical books out there that some people still accept as being scripture. Uh, Old Testament books, for example, the Book of Enoch would be one. The Book of Janus and Jambres. The Book of Jasher. Uh, the Book of the Wars of the Lord, uh, the Assumption of Moses, uh, the Book of Shemia, the Prophet, uh, the Book of Samuel, the Seer, the Book of Nathan, the Prophet, the Book of Gad, the Seer, the Book of Jehu, the Acts of Uzziah. Uh, a lot of those books there, uh, particularly like you know, Samuel, Nathan, Gad, are books that are, were actual things that were recorded, but they weren't included in Scripture because they weren't Scripture. Uh, a lot of these, though, are just plain, fictitious, fake items, like the Book of Enoch, the Book of Janus and Jambres, uh, and some others. New Testament 
uh, other books that are, you know, supposedly uh, scripture that weren't included. Uh, uh, the book of Menander, the book of Epimenides, uh, the book of Aratus. Uh, you have the epistle to the Laodiceans. Now Paul refers in uh, Colossians, tells them to read this epistle to the church of Laodicea and read the letter that I sent to it. Okay, yeah, there was an actual letter that was sent. God didn't include it in the canon. All right, uh, you have that. You have a book called the Martyrdom of Isaiah. Uh, you have a gospel called uh, the Infancy Gospel of Thomas. Well, the Apostle Thomas wrote this. And then there's also the Spurus, the Gospel of Mary Magdalene, uh, which has you know, Mary Magdalene and our Lord in a uh, fornicative relationship, okay, which is just disgusting as far as I'm concerned. Uh, those are the 37 to which I'm aware. Who knows if there's been others. Uh, this what brought this all ahead was a, uh, I was privy to a conversation uh, that revolved around the question, somebody had posed the question, if the Jews accept the book of Enoch, why do Christians not accept it? <laughs> uh, there's only going to be three people that I could think of that would ask such a question. A brand new baby Christian who doesn't know any better. A Christian who is not in a Bible-believing church and being taught <laughs> and preached to uh, what is correct and what is not, or an agent of the devil. In this case, I, from the conversation, I was pretty sure it's an agent of the devil involved in this. All right, the Book of Enoch, all the fragments that have been found for this are in three languages, either A America, no, oh, A America, uh, Aramaic, yeah, I got it backwards, can't talk straight, but Aramaic from the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, Keon Greek, which of course is a dead language, uh, and Latin. Okay? The Jews have never accepted this book as scripture. And I can tell you why. It's never been found in a Hebrew text. Okay? Uh, it's a spurious book from the late second or early third century AD. Okay, the Jews don't accept it because it didn't exist. Okay, when the Old Testament was completed. All right, it's a complete piece of bunk. <laughs> now, whoever created it, they created it based off of. The book of Jude, verses 14 and 15. Go over there with me. Just before the book of the Revelation, Jude, one chapter book. And in there you have these two verses. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his angels to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all of their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Well, where did that come from? Where did that quote come from? Oh, yeah? You're not going to find it anywhere else in the Bible uh, there. So, you know, some shyster uh, decided that, okay, well, I'm going to come up with, you know, the book of Enoch. Okay, and so somebody sat down, you know, just like Joseph Smith sat down and wrote his fictitious books, you know, the Book of Mormon and Pearl of Great Price and all this. Somebody sat down and did this based off of that right there. All right, there never has been a book of Enoch. Okay. Well, then where did those two books... Okay, uh, it's called divine inspiration. Okay, God could simply have, through the Holy Spirit of God, given that enlightenment to Jude 
to write down. Okay. I mean, there's a lot of things that have been said. You know, it's like a, a, at the end of the book of John where it says that if all the things have been, you know, spoken and done by Christ, you know, the, you know, the, the world couldn't contain the books <laughs> that were there. We, you know, uh, what we have that has been preserved for us has been done by God because this is what he wants us to have. And he does things in this way so that, hey, yeah, if you want to <laughs> you wanna make your own news, he'll help you not it. <laughs> you know? Where does that come from? Where does that quote? How does that come along right there? It may have been so, you know, something that had been handed down, you know, through the centuries just as verbal. I don't think that's the case, though. Uh, I believe that the Holy Spirit of God inspired Jude, okay, which in this case, who we're talking about here is Jude and Judas. This is the half brother of the Lord Jesus Christ, inspired him to write this down. And he obeyed. And that's why we have it, okay? Why we have the book of Enoch is somebody who obviously doesn't believe in God, doesn't trust God, uh, doesn't believe in divine inspiration. You know, oh, look, look what I found. I have found the lost book of, you know. Right. You know. <laughs> yeah. So, that's why the Jews have never, so the person posting this, this comment is, if the Jew, well, who says the Jews do? Where did you get that from? And how they said we're not Christians, said, why don't we? Well, who is we? <laughs> you know, that's why I say this is one of Satan's agents trying to stir stir up trouble, stir people up. Okay, if of course it wasn't accepted by the King James translators, they looked at all this stuff. It was out there, they knew it was out there. Uh, and it was rejected. It didn't meet the criteria. Now, this is the book, and if you're not familiar with the book of Enoch, which I wouldn't expect anybody to be, there's no need to be. Like I say, I'm not telling anybody, go and read any of this garbage. Don't waste your time with it. But that is the basis, uh, the guide that was used for producing the movie that came out in 2014 of Noah with Russell Crowe. That is where most people have had contact with that in recent years. And of course, the movie itself is pure fiction in here, completely non-biblical. And you Christians get sucked into that Book of Enoch uh, for a few reasons. Number one, it does contain some biblical truths. Well, of course it does, because you know how they put the book together is that, okay, we're dealing with Enoch. Let's go back to uh, the pre-flood chapters in the Bible and use these things, okay, to put together. So, yeah, they, they stole stuff right out of the scriptures. I mean, again, you read Joseph Smith uh, stuff. And again, not telling anyone to go and read any crazy Joe stuff. I'm familiar with it because I need to be familiar with it. Okay, and you can tell if they steal, if they, some of the cases are just plagiarizing directly, you know. Uh, you know, even uh, Muhammad, uh, stuff that he had people write down because, you know, he was an uneducated, illiterate, <laughs> uh, epileptic pedophile and never wrote a thing in his life. Uh, you know, had quoted stuff that was just scripture, the few things they have. So because you can go in there and see stuff that lines up with what the scripture says, well, it's because they copy it out of there. Okay? It's not Holy Scripture. It's not corroborative prophecy whatsoever. And it discusses subjects that are popular with people today. It talks about the devils and who they are and where they came from. It talks about uh, a people called the Nephilim. Okay? Which, you know, we'll come back to that. It talks about the angels. Okay, uh, it talks about Noah's flood and so forth. And so, you know, 
people not knowing it better get pulled into this thing and sucked into the thing. One of the things, for example, talks about the watchers. Okay, the watchers, which is just a translation of the word there, which is a reference to the angels of God. It means to be awake or watchful. Okay. Uh, you know, uh, it's all that same word is translated the same way out of the Aramaic and Greek texts. All right. Uh, but that's all that the watchers are. We're just God's angels. Okay. Uh, the Nephilim, that's a Hebrew word. And we find that word in Genesis chapter 6. Go over there with me. Genesis chapter 6. Verse 4. And there were Nephilim in the earth in those days. Okay, it is translated there as Giants. When the sons of God came into the daughters of men, they bare children to them. The same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. Okay, that is who the Nephilim are. They were the giants. No great mystery of anything here. Okay, except how they go along and twist and pervert this whole thing. See the book of Enoch contains five chapters in it. Okay, what's the number five represent? Death. <laughs> uh, it has, the first one is the book of the watchers. The book of the watchers is uh, all about angels and angels who fell. Well, you can pull all of that right out of the scripture. Uh, then it has the parables of Enoch. Uh, Again, a bunch of gobbledygook there. The book of the heavenly luminaries, you know, talking about the sun and the moon and the stars. Uh, book four is the dream visions, and the last is the epistle of Enoch, uh, which in that epistle of Enoch, okay, is where we find they plagiarize, take directly out of the Bible those two verses that we read in Jude 14 and 15, okay? It's garbage. It's total garbage. The problem being here with both lost and saved getting pulled into any of these books, and I'm just using this one as an example because it was the one that was brought up, uh, is there's things in there that, okay, because there are some Bible truths in it, they think the rest of the stuff is true, which it's not. For example, here's one of the big ones in there. Uh, in the Book of the Watchers, it gives you the names and functions of the seven archangels. The seven archangels. Uh, the very first one is Jophiel. Or, or Jophiel. Okay. Uh, it's a woman. It's a she. Okay, what do we know about angels? They're all male. Okay, but she is the one who guards the Torah. You know? Total bunk. Gabriel, well, we know Gabriel. We read of Gabriel, but instead of being a messenger of God, uh, they said he's an archangel and that he's the guardian of Israel. Well, that's baloney. That's Michael's job. <laughs> Michael is also in here. They have Michael in there as the captain of God's army. Then you've got some more. Uh, Telephiel, he is supposed to be the one who lifts up men's prayers to God. I'm sorry, I have a high priest that's doing that for me. Thank you very much. All right. Uriel, he is the angel of the earth, the angel of the elements. Raphael, remember that's the one that that Coop brought up. Raphael, uh, he is the uh, the one who heals and casts out devils. Well, what a lie there is! He is a devil. <laughs> okay, a Barachiel, Okay, he is a prince amongst the angels, and it says that he leads four hundred and ninety-six thousand angels. Really, where'd you dig that up? You know. 
all the ones here that the bogus names, okay, so if we take Gabriel and Michael out and the other ones there, guess where they all came from? Babylon. They all came from Babylon. These are things that came back with the Jews from Babylon. Okay? Uh, you'll find some of this stuff here, these names here, in the Gemara. Okay? You have the... Uh, Oh, I'm like, that's a Gemara. I'll take that back. Although the Gemara is going to comment on it. Uh, Talmud. The Babylonian Talmud is where you will find that. And then there's a the Gemara and the Mishnah, which are commentaries on these things. They brought a lot of this pagan stuff back with them. Out of the, remember, we had talked uh, a couple of months ago about Lilith. We were talking in the early stages of our talking about women of the Bible. You know, when we started, we were talking about Eve, and we're saying that there were those who, you know, amongst the Jews that were that whole Lilith. That, well, that all came out of Babylon. That all came out of Babylon, and that's where all of these come from. Is the Babylonian Talmud? This was stuff that they brought back, uh, but there, there's no biblical basis for any of it. Okay. Uh, it, it's again, it's garbage, you know. And I'm, again, I'm telling you, don't waste your time in any of this. Okay, you don't, you don't want to. To me, that getting into that stuff and studying it and reading, it, it, it might as well be bringing in a Ouija board and a, and a book of witchcraft into your house. Don't mess with it. Okay, I only touch off on the periphery just enough to be able to point out what you don't want to mess with. All right. Okay, and this becomes the basis for. The worship of angels. Okay, you have now today amongst uh, the Jews, to some extent, some worshiping of angels. Okay, and it's wrecked in the Church of Rome. They've even they've even canonized some and you know given sainthood to some supposed angels here and again these, these names that are, are used in here the devil is what they are uh, you know there's a lot of Christians that have gone into praying to angels and Colossians 2.18 tells us very plainly let no man beguile you of your reward in number one a voluntary humility so it's faith and a worshipping of angels why? Because it's intruding into those things which he had not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. Okay, we don't worship angels. You know? uh, in fact, in the Bible, okay, you've got the angel telling John, you know, no, don't you worship me. You know, telling Peter, don't you worship me. Tell, you, know, you don't worship me. Okay? I'm a servant of God, just like you are. Don't you dare you worship God. Worship God. You know, and a great many, like I say, of both unsaved and saved have fallen into that trap. Now, a lot of people not realizing that that's where they got their script line for that movie of Noah, which, like I said, completely fictitious. You know, great Hollywood story, about all it is, but as far as biblical, absolutely, completely, totally fictitious there. And that has brought about a renewed interest in a lot of these things. Uh, you know, you've got some of these others here again, like the Gospel of Mary Magdalene. Oh, well, that, that was a huge popular thing in the 70s uh, because of two Broadway shows, Jesus Christ Superstar and Godspell. Okay? And in both cases, they've got Jesus Christ and Mary Magdalene you know, having a sexual relationship with each other. Uh, there was a movie brought out, I want to say maybe about 2010 or so, uh, Tom Hanks, 
uh, and everything where they were, uh, you know, pursuing the bloodline of Christ, you know, and intimating that are, there are human beings alive today who are the physical descendants of Jesus Christ and Mary Magdalene. You know, and that's the true Holy Grail. And again, a bunch of demonic garbage. Garbage. That stuff right there. Uh, what was he? Oh, yeah, the infancy gospel of Thomas. Okay. Completely spurious. Completely spurious. You know, there, 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 there was no gospel of the infancy of Jesus Christ. <laughs> you know, oh, but people, well, why aren't these in the Bible? Why didn't they? Th you know, again, this all comes from either being a baby Christian and just not knowing any better, okay? Not being in a church where they believe that God has perfectly preserved his word and they're not being taught and preached to from that perspective, or they're the agent of, agent of the devil. Okay, and there, you know, for example, uh, your brother Paul's second wife, what's your name? Melissa. Melissa. Uh, you know, she's into that worshiping of angel stuff. Uh, you know, and it, you know, and of course, not surprisingly, she's also a charismatic. Uh, you're going to find that kind of a mentality uh, among people who are, you know, if they're not solid on this, that God has perfectly preserved his words for us, okay, and he can't do it in 350 different English language versions. There's only one is going to be right because none of them agree with each other. All right? I mean, it, so do your research, you know, and pick one. Okay, I've done my research, and I know this is the perfectly preserved words of God, the authorized version of 1611. No question or doubt about it in my mind whatsoever. Therefore, if this is what God has perfectly preserved for me as His words, anything else? Yeah. If it's not in here, it's because God didn't want it in here. Okay, so if you're in that kind of a mentality and mindset, okay, then you don't believe and trust this thing, period, anyways. Okay, and what you're doing is you're going around and you're looking for stuff that you like and things that it's all, it's what I want, what I like, what I think, my preferences. I mean, that's where you end up with groups like the Unitarian Universalist Church, where everything goes. You know, whatever you want, you know? Oh, your dog is your prophet. Amen. <laughs> Have him in to speak sometime. <laughs> you know? uh, and this is the problem that you run into with this stuff. You know, the conflict of Adam and Eve. No such thing recorded there. None of that exists in there. Uh, you know, and again, some of these books that we find referred to in the scriptures, okay, uh, you know, the, the book of Samuel the seer, well, you know what that is, First and Second Samuel, they're out looking for something, <laughs> it, it's there, you know, the book of Nathan the prophet, you know, whatever it is that Nathan wrote down, uh, you know, whether it's in some other part of the Bible or not, but, you know, uh, just because we find it, it referred to, you know, the epistle of the Laodiceans, okay, doesn't mean that that was inspired scripture because it's referred to in the Bible. If it were, you know, it would be, you know, the ascension of Moses. Moses didn't ascend anywhere. Okay, he died. He died. His body went into the ground. Tells us that in Jude, that, you know, Satan was trying to steal his body, and Michael, God sent Michael down to resist him down there. Uh, his his soul went down to paradise. He didn't ascend anywhere. Okay, he is being resurrected 
as one of the two witnesses during the, the tribulation period, you know, the ascension of Moses. Where do you get that? You don't. Okay, that's as spur as the ascension of Mary. So you have to be really careful with this stuff. You know, uh, I mean, again, Maccabees. Maccabees is legitimate as history, but there's nothing spiritual in it. You know, some of these books I remember reading as a kid because I was raised as a Catholic, and you know, we had the great big white leather covered coffee table Bible sitting out there, and you know, uh, at times when I was incredibly bored, I would read, you know, I, I read that stuff. It's, it's all just history there. Bell and the Dragon, well, that ain't, that's about as satanic as you can get. Uh, so much of it, you know, the, the 151st Psalm.